Do you know that 75% of children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates? And if you're shaking your head going, oh my God, that's horrible for children, you are not much better. And we're going to find out why and more importantly, what you can do about that with our guest today on the Movement Movement Podcast. But first, hello, I'm Stephen Sashen from ZeroShoes.com, your host for the Movement Movement Podcast. And I call it the Movement Movement because uh, we are creating a movement movement here at Zero Shoes in particular. We're trying to make natural movement the obvious, better, healthy choice the way natural food is. And this is a grassroots groundswell thing that it's going to take to make that happen, to overcome the mythology, the lies, the propaganda that you've been hearing from Big Shoe, because the Movement Movement podcast is for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body to enjoy running, hiking, playing, dancing, or whatever it is that you enjoy doing feet first, since those things are your foundation. You know the drill if you like what you hear here. Um, here, here, that's fun. Then go to jointhemovementmovement.com. You can find out all the different places you can interact with us. And wherever you're enjoying this podcast, like and subscribe and review and share and click the bell if you're on YouTube and you know how to do all of those things. So let's jump in. Um, I'm really happy to be joined by our guest, Daryl Edwards. Daryl, I don't even do intros for people because anything I would say would sound ridiculous and scripted and stupid. So why don't you tell human beings who you are, what you're doing here, and why you have the great sci-fi look because I can see the reflection of the screen in your glasses. It's like you're being controlled. Okay, so is that a, yes, okay. Oh. So as, oh, nice. I'll just remove them. Okay. Oh, so wow. It's like those, Clark, wait, it's like Clark Kent. Okay, wait. That's Clark if Kent. If you recognize me, this is Daryl Edwards, glasses on. Clark Kent. Now Superman. I become superhuman without Superman. them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I actually prefer... I prefer Clark Kent to Superman because you don't know how strong Clark Kent is, but he's just as strong as Superman. Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah, yes. Better to look weak and be strong than strong and be weak. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so yes, I'm Daryl Edwards. I reside in London, England, and I am the founder of Primal Play. And Primal Play is really blending primal, natural, instinctive, universal movement. Uh, that's kind of informed by evolutionary biology, evolutionary fitness. What did our ancestors do and how can it inform us today in a 21st century in a very sedentary environment? And using play theory to make what we have to do to, to maintain good health and vitality, um, make it more fun and engaging and joyful. So that's really what Primal Play is about. So before we jump in, and I want to I want to have you share a movement thing that um, the listeners slash viewers can do. Um, I know that you have the history. How you got here is one of those. It's a classic story. It's what we hear all the time. It's, it couldn't be more normal. Tell people how yes. this happened because this is one of my favorite things. So I my former career, uh, I was a computer programmer in in, in investment banking. I was a software engineer. Um, you know tech consultant and I basically designed systems that were helping banks make lots of money and so and, typically, and people in that job typically very active spend a lot of time not in a chair don't spend any time just staring at a screen all day long so it's obvious that you know you became Mr. Primal Play <laughs> yes yeah exactly what that was the, the natural evolution of spending 16 to 18 hours a day pretty much in a chair eating in my, in my chair, surrounded by computer screens, um, not socializing apart from, unless it was a computer screen. That was the only interface that I was very familiar with. And, you know, of course, having annual health checks and then being told, Mr. Edwards, you're pre-diabetic. You're pretty much on the cusp of full-blown type 2 diabetes. You have uh, elevated risk of cardiovascular disease, which means, you know, it could be a stroke, could be a heart attack within the next few years. Uh, you have hypertension pretty much through the roof. You, you were how old at this point? Now, I was in my early to mid thirties at Jeez. that point, and that was that was around two thousand and three, two thousand and three four. So, um, you know, and I was kind of like, really, at my age, you know, this is, isn't this the sort of stuff that is part of getting old, and I'm, you know, getting older, and I, I don't feel that old. And it was like, well, you know, there's, you know, genetics, um, family members that that have some of these these ailments. So that's probably what it is. Uh, and you're just getting it sooner than, than we'd expect. So I was like, okay, fine. What can I do about it? No problem. Statins for your cholesterol problems and your triglyceride problems, uh, metformin for your blood sugar regulation to get your blood glucose down, take some beta blockers for your, you know, your blood pressure, get that down pain relief for your, your bad back, your chronic low back pain. 
you know, so all of these issues, the solution was a cocktail of meds. And trust me, I would have taken them if they hadn't told me, Daryl, they will be for, with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, this isn't a, this isn't a fix. Right. This is kind of supporting you for the rest of your life and dependency on these drugs. And secondly, if we have side effects, we'll switch out with something else. So I'm like, that sounds like an awful life to look forward to when you're in your thirties, right? You know, so I was like, I'm not ready for this. I don't want to deal with the side effects. What else can I do? Um, and the only thing that I knew in, in relation to health and well-being about any of those conditions were that physical activity would help with my blood pressure. So I was like, let me actually just become more active, join a gym, start exercising and seeing if there is any transformation. So I wasn't looking for a physical transformation. I actually was skinny fat at the time. Right. So I didn't have, you know, I didn't have any outward appearance of, of having overweight or obesity, but I had a lot of internal, you know, visceral fat. Well, and that's something, um, you know, and, and, and people can't see this obviously or hear this, but you are not yes. a small guy. Uh, how tall are you? I'm six four. Yeah. So six four. You, know, you can kind of hide that well when you're that tall. Yes. And I certainly, and I certainly did. I, and um, I was probably about at that stage, maybe 30 pounds lighter than I am now. Lighter? Um, lighter. Yes. So I've, I've, I've gained quite a bit of muscle since then, but, but so I was, I was definitely leaner, um, but I didn't have much lean body mass, right. not much lean muscle mass. It was pretty much just, you know, high levels of body fat in a very slim frame. Right. So becoming active, my blood pressure started to come down within, within about two months, blood pressure up to my, was, was normal. I shouldn't say optimal. It was optimal. It was normal. Um, my blood sugars normalized. So I was no longer pre-diabetic. Um, my lipid profile started to improve. So the markers they were looking at my HDL was getting, was getting higher. My LDL was coming down. The ratios were improving. Um, the inflammation that I had, the uh, kind of chronic inflammation was reducing. So everything was looking really good. And my doctor was like, keep doing this, whatever you're doing, Daryl, keep doing this. And then I started to ponder about, well, maybe what sort of diet should I, should I investigate? So anyway, so for me, physical activity was the gateway to living a healthier lifestyle. Um, and I was kind of like month to month thinking if I can delay my meds just for another 30 days or so, that's a good thing. How long yeah. can I do this for? And it's now been 15, 16 years on that journey, um, leaving banking in 2011 and embarking on finding out what I was most passionate about in terms of communicating that to, to the world at large. <laughs> so, uh, so movement became my passion rather than nutrition um, and movement as medicine and understanding the science of movement, physical activity and how the body responds to this sort of healthful um, intervention and how it helped me with my conditions that, right. I, that I was suffering from at the time how it prevented those fast forwarding to, to real issues. And then finally thinking, how can I make this sustainable? Because even mm. though I joined a gym back then, I was certainly a serial gym membership, uh, you know, sign up individual, yeah. you know, like every January one, two, I'm <laughs> signing up 12 month contract. Yep. I'm going to be here three, four times a week religiously, pretty much By second February. week of Jan. <laughs> habits would there. change. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the end of Jan, I was probably attending once a week, you know, at most. Monday was always going to be the day that I would start. Uh, yeah, I'll start again next Monday. And so even though I realized there were benefits from physical activity and I had this really good outcome from physical activity, it wasn't sustainable for me. I, right. It was difficult to motivate myself. I was seduced by my armchair far more than me getting on my training shoes and getting out, you know, getting to the gym or getting outside that changed as I started to think about our, the, what was our gym back for our hunter gatherer ancestors, right? Our gym was the world around us. You know, it was our, it was a natural environment we were in. We didn't train, you know, um, by using exercises and, and, and physical activity kind of snippets here and there to become adept to what we did for survival. It was living 
surviving meant we had to perform certain movement patterns. And so that shift in the way that I thought about movement and how relevant it is, it is to us as humans and how part of that exploration of movement and just considering what my body's capable of doing within a natural environment right. is what started to change my approach and my enjoyment of movement. So before we jump into more specifics about that, which I definitely want to do, let's back up and do two things. First, um, I, I want to talk about the thing that I opened with, which is what you gave me, the stat about uh, most kids doing less physical activity than prison inmates and my addition that most adults are pretty much the same. Um, yes. And uh, But before we get into even that, uh, is there anything you can think of just to share with people? I always love to start with a movement, although we're already... 14 or something minutes in, so we're not starting, but that's cool. Uh, anything that you want to share, some movement, something that people can either do right now while they're listening or watching, or that they can do, you know, later when they get home and they're doing whatever they're doing, something just to give them a thing to get their body doing something else other than sitting and listening to us. Yeah. So, um, I would say probably a closed chain, open chain movement. So literally, and, and part of this is going to be some visualization. So I want to imagine you're compressing um, a ball. Okay. So like, so, so like literally, literally holding your hands up. You, you, yeah. So you're holding a ball about like right. basketball size or medicine ball size. Um, yeah. Medicine ball size. Okay. So, so if you can see this literally, whatever, whatever you can see right now, that's the, the sort of circumference of this ball. Got it. Um, let's imagine it's, it's, it's made of titanium. Okay. So you're going to have to push really hard to compress this, take a few deep breaths, one, two, and really push full tension everywhere. Keep breathing though. Do not hold your breath. Push, 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 push. You want to squeeze it to tennis ball size. Push, 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 push. Get the fingers closer together. Okay, right. And as soon as you've got that, take a big deep breath in and then expand. So you're kind of pulling now this time. Pull even slower, even slower, even slower. Okay, pull, 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 and really open the chest. And now you're, you're extending this as, almost as far as you can, opening the chest, opening the chest, squeezing the shoulder blades, and relax. <sighs> that's Whew. good. Thank you. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, even just using your imagination and visualization, you can create quite a lot of te muscle tension. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that basic, I mean, yeah, for people who aren't watching, I mean, I was shaking from the tension. So it's a moving isometric thing. But the, I love the contract and then expand part. I especially love the expand because we're, since our eyes are in front of our face, we tend to focus on contracting things that we can see, but not yes. on the things that open up behind yes, to us. The, to the periphery. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Exactly. And, and you're almost trying to, you know, you're working the antagonist Yep. muscles so you're trying to in that sense that contraction is part of that pulling or that extraction so you're trying to pull pull that ball apart as you're expanding the chest this, and squeeze it this is a weird tangent um two three years ago three years ago coming up so, oh wow coming up in two days uh i had shoulder surgery i had pretty massive reconstruction of my shoulder in fact after my surgery uh and they also had to cut my biceps tendon and screw it into my arm in a different spot. My doctor comes in when I wake up and he says, oh, wow, we'd had to do a lot of work in there. I said, I don't know how I feel about you being so giddy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so then I did, you know, all this physical therapy and it was, how do I want to describe it? It was very, oh boy, I don't even know where to begin. Suffice it to say two years of physical therapy and it really didn't help a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I, I, I got into this thing, a few months ago, I have no idea why. I put a chin up bar uh, in our, the second bedroom that we have in our house. We use, it's got a sofa bed and our TV. That's the only place we have a television. So that's where Lane and I watch TV every night after we're done working. And I put a chin up bar between in that room uh, where the bathroom is. So whenever you go in or out of the bathroom, there's a chin up bar. So I started doing just a set of pull ups to failure, but not just, you know, doing or chin ups actually, but not just trying to get my chin over the bar, but just really extending, getting my elbows behind me. So when I'm doing the chin up, the bar ends up touching the top of my chest. So I'm really getting this full range of a very natural movement. And I started noticing after a couple of months, my shoulder was like 80% better than it's been in 30 years. Yeah. So that whole thing of the extension part of the chin up mm -hmm. rather than just the pulling is the thing that really made a huge difference for me. So I love in that thing that you did just what the extension does because our shoulders are typically kind of rounded. Chests are usually 
caved in, especially yes. me, the former All-American gymnast, where that caved in feeling is like the most important motion there is. I spent 30 years trying to get the gymnast out of my body. So, <laughs> so I really like that one. Sounds good. Oh, so, no. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I can still hear. I mean, it, it takes, it's quite an aerobic you know, I can see, I can hear your breathing pattern has changed yeah. you know, after that because it, 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 you know, it doesn't look that intense, but you know, you felt what that intensity is like. Oh yeah. And, and, and there's a significant oxygen demand after the activity Afterwards. itself. Well, it's, yes. an aerob it, it's an anaerobic movement. So the oxygen kicks in later. It's the same thing when I'm That's sprinting, like I do hundred meters, I take three breaths, but then as soon as I'm done, I can't breathe for another three or four minutes. Oh but yes, yes, yes. What's Deep interesting for people to try the, this though, is that, I mean, it really, how do I want to put this? There's an incredible neurological component because the amount of tension that you create uh, is the more comfortable you get doing this, the more tension you can create. The more tension you can create, sometimes the harder it is to do because you're really pushing the envelope of what your mind is telling you that your body can actually handle. And when you're yes. not... When you have nothing but it's totally isometric, there's no way you're going to do something stupidly dangerous. You, you can't yes. really. Exactly. So, yeah, this is almost a way of you, you pushing past what would be your, your, your natural limitation, your conditioned limitation you can hit based on a certain number of kilos or right. pounds per square inch in terms of pressure. But here it's just about your mind. Yeah. And what you imagine that you're pushing. And so almost the more conditions you get, the more focus you can get, the more difficult it becomes. So it never yeah. gets easier. No, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it never gets easier. Um, and I think if you can combine this in a very short space of time and, and working on full range and you're not just working on the, on the push, but also on the pull. So you're mm -hmm. working on the opposing muscle groups mm -hmm. and you're kind of opening up um, where most of our movements tend to be here closed um, and you're getting this the afterburn effect which is uh, excessive post oxygen consumption so that's the anaerobic component where you do some work you don't really breathe that much you don't need oxygen to fuel that activity right. but afterwards your body's like give me some oxygen please <laughs> you know? um, so yeah it's a very powerful and potent aspect of, of movement even within that small yeah yeah uh, it reminds me, the whole, the whole post, post oxygen consumption thing reminds me of an argument that I have on a very regular basis with fitness guys who, who are promoting high intensity interval training and especially the ones who have the instructions, just sprint all out for 30 seconds and then rest for 30 seconds, then just do that eight times. And I go, okay, look, if you can do that more than two times, you might be running as fast as you can run, but you are not sprinting. And they go, no, it's not exactly. about you know, getting the same time. It's like going as hard as you can. I don't think you get it. If you're a real sprinter, you can do that one and a half times <laughs> and then you're totally, done. Totally agreed. I mean, I think even 30 seconds um, is probably outside of most oh, individuals, oh, you know, yeah. high intensity uh, time. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. Look, even, um, even if you look at people, um, so 200 meter sprinters, I mean, that's, they're going all out for 200 meters. Not really. They're kind of floating around the turn sometimes, but, but there's no one who can sprint all out for 30 yes. seconds. I mean, it's not exactly. possible. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. Some of the, the hit kind of hit training protocols I see when you see people saying, Oh, I did, I did my 45 minute hit class and they're, <laughs> and they're, and they're pretty much moving all throughout the class. I'm like, that's not yeah. hit. You know, yeah. it's probably vigorous intensity. Right. Um, you know, high, you know, vigorous intensity, aerobic activity. But I was like, trust me, you would do like a Tabata protocol is a classic example. Yep. 20 seconds on 10 seconds off and you've got, and you do it for four minutes. That, that's, that's the end of the session. And you know, usually you, you can't maintain what you could do for that first sec 20 seconds right. for all eight rounds. And as you, as I'm sure you're aware, the protocol was designed for um, Japanese Olympic elite cyclist. level Olympian cyclists. Yeah. Speed. Right. They're actually speed, speed yeah. skaters. They're Oh, really? I thought it was cyclists. Yeah, it was speed skaters. Oh, interesting. Um, um, so, yeah, so, you know, they, they are able to push themselves. Right. At well, least psychologically. It's, it's funny. With, with Tabata, I, um, I, I certainly can't do it running. There's just no way. Um, and cycling, when I had a uh, – I used to have a recumbent stationary bike in my house. I could get away with it there. But the, the thing the, – when I was doing that protocol, I was doing it with a water rower. And for whatever reason, that whole body motion, I could pull it off. But those, that last one, sometimes those last two sets, 
after it's done, I, I would just fall. Luckily, it was, you know, low to the ground. I would fall over. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, I'd get up. And I, I loved it. I mean, I really enjoyed doing it. But, mm, man, mm. if you're really going to do it, it is, that is a beast. Yes, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's unfortunate that, that it's, it's become almost diluted. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and whereby, you know, people, oh, yeah, I'm doing, you know, I did a one-hour hit session. I'm like, <laughs> no, you, you didn't. Weren't. You weren't doing hit. Uh, just, <laughs> let me just tell you that now. And the few times that I have done hit, you know, I've done my, I've done my Tabata sessions four minutes. Yeah. You know, it's like you're breathing fire. That's the one thing yeah. that I can say. You're breathing fire. I mean, you, you, you're certainly saying, please stop. Even after the first round, you're like, oh, that's not too bad. But the, probably second, second round one, onwards, you're like. After the second one, you know you made a mistake. Um, yeah. <laughs> when, when is this going to, when is this going to finish? But, th but this is of course the thing that's so, so entertaining is people, I'll say like you and me for the fun of it. Um, you, you know, you made a mistake, but at the same time, it's like, well, I'm not going to stop. I mean, I'm in, I mean, it's only, you know, it's six more I'm in, but yeah, what's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's also so interesting is that it is so much a mental thing because you, you have that 20 seconds on and the first five seconds in that 10 seconds off, it's like, all right, I, maybe I could just, I'll do this tomorrow. And then the last five seconds, you know, you're just fighting with your own brain going, all right, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And then you start getting going again. And the first 10 seconds, you know, it's like, all right, I can make this. And the next five seconds, you're not so sure. And the last five mm. seconds, you want to shoot yourself again. Yeah. <laughs> it again. yeah it's, it's a real, it really is a psychological battle. It's incredible. You know, the, the, the brain, the mind versus the versus muscle. Yeah. Um, but really. yeah, it's, it's, it's a very effective protocol. You can save yourself a lot of time, but I think we just have to make sure we are doing pointless doing four minutes jogging right you know and then saying oh yeah or you know or 45 minutes jogging saying hey i did a hit train hit jogging session uh, you know 20 percent of my you know of my potential going all out mm, no not, not so quite yeah. <laughs> um so yeah. moving moving back to the, the thing that we opened with about kids spending less time outdoors than uh inmates who do an hour a day typically um mm. Talk to me about that and just sort of where you found that and how that's impacting what you're doing and also uh, uh, just w how you're seeing that that true for adults as well. And basically, just that's an amazing statistic that we that look, I spend most of my day, I'm standing or walking because I've got a treadmill desk, but I spend most of my day in the office. Uh, I'm on the track on the weekends and sometimes once or twice during the week. Uh, I'm in the gym or not the gym, my basement where I've got my gym a couple times a week as well. But man, I don't get outside more than a few hours a week and that's on the weekends and when I am going to and coming home from work. It's, it's when, I, when I said that out loud, I thought about my own life. It's like, oh crap. Yeah, that's probably me, me, me in there too. Um, well, I mean, I gave, I gave a TED talk uh, recently and uh, I called why working out isn't working out. Nice. And it was just one of the stats that I pulled. I had so many interesting stats around both children's physical inactivity and the epidemic of physical inactivity and also for adults. So children from sort of five to 17 should be getting an hour a day that's the minimum recommendation by most health authorities, public health organizations, 60 minutes per day of um, moderate to vigorous intensity activity, two to three days a week should also include, you know, muscle building, climbing, jumping, you know, that, that, that sort of thing, intense, uh, vigorous intensity activity. So when you compare that to what kids are actually doing, then that's where you hit this 75% of, of kids not, not doing that, not getting outside for one, and right. not um, meeting that level of physical activity. And when you get more scientific and look at the research, the research tells us about a third of adults, UK and US, meet the guidelines of 150 minutes per week. Wow. Right? Um, of um, moderate intensity physical activity. So that's kind of like brisk walk, jog, going for a run, biking. That, that gives you an idea of what moderate intensity is. And, um, and it also includes two days a week of resistance training. So there are many people who may hit the aerobic component, but certainly aren't hitting the resistance well, component or the, vice versa. The people that I know who are hitting the aerobic component, who are doing who are like runners, a lot of runners, they, despite my repeatedly saying, 
do some strength work. And despite my pointing out that every researcher who is looking at running injuries, the first thing they have that, that they're doing with almost everybody is discovering that they have weak glutes, especially glute medius, and yes. working on their glute strength. No, no matter how many times you tell people this, uh, especially competitive runners, like older masters athletes, they mm. are, I'm surprised at how resistant they are to doing this. And especially if you say, take two days off from running and do some strength training, you, you watch the blood drain from their face. I mean, it's yes. amazing to me. It, it is amazing. And, and, and just to take that, just to take that one step further in two directions, actually, let's go towards a sedentary individual and a non-exercise individual. So the research, a third of U, uh, UK, US adults meeting the guidelines, that's based on a questionnaire. <laughs> when you take those same, same adults and they wear an accelerometer, right, right. only 5% of adults, US adults, meet the guidelines. 5%, <laughs> one in 20 yeah. adults. And, and, um, and that's not even including the resistance component. So it's probably right. even less than 5% most, uh, most likely. So yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's horrendous. So it's about 8% for children right. um, in the US meeting the guidelines of 60 minutes. Um, based on accelerometer data and um, 5% for adults. There was a, an, a, an app that was created uh, by some people that I know here in town. It was basically a pedometer for kids. And the idea was that uh, for as many steps as you took or however active you were, you got points, you could trade those points in for stuff you could, you could buy, I guess. And uh, as soon as I heard this, I said, okay, it's going to sell really well for a couple of years because the parents are going to go, oh, my kids totally need this. And mm -hmm. then it's going to fade because the kids won't use it or more accurately, they'll probably sit there watching TV, just shaking the thing around. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, and then when I saw the promo video for, for this device at one point, they actually had a kid who was just shaking the thing. And I was going, why did you put that in? And it, it's exactly what happened. Like parents thought it was a great idea, but there was not one kid mm -hmm. who was thinking, oh, this is awesome. I totally want to use this to win valuable prizes. And uh, it really is uh, outrageous. The, of course, there's a funny thing about Fitbits and stuff like that where for a lot of people, the fact that it's tracking your activity suddenly makes activity less interesting because it seems more goal oriented than enjoyment oriented. Yes. And, and, and I actually cover some interesting stats again. I'm kind of plugging my TED talk, but, uh, but interestingly, 50% of people who buy wearable tech for activity, like Fitbits and, and the like, yeah. just keep them in their kitchen drawer or whatever. They, they literally buy them. Yeah pop them away somewhere they never see them again out of the, the other 50 percent who use them after three months only 26 percent of that 50 percent are still using their devices right <laughs> and and so it actually doesn't increase it will increase the amount of physical activity for those who are probably already physically interested active in staying somewhere. active yeah. anyway yeah yeah so so we'll probably get more meaningful data and it might give us a, a bit of gamification when we go, oh, you know, I haven't quite hit my target today. But for your average Joe or Jane who are looking to start that renewal relationship with exercise, um, I, I believe it's actually detrimental because it becomes <laughs> almost like a, a burden. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, it, Did it, I miss it again? If you miss it I one mean, yeah. day, it's like, oh, I missed it again. You start to feel bad. My, my yes. sprinting training partner, she's 65. She's a world champion in the 200 meters. And she's multiple world champion uh, or, or world medalist at least. And uh, she says, for me, it's the exact opposite. I said, what do you mean? It motivates you? She goes, no, it tells me when I need to stop. <laughs> says, you finished your workout for the day. She says, all right, all right. Yes, all right. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing too much. Because that's the, I suppose that's the, you know, the, the other side of the bell curve. Um, you know, so obviously we know for sedentary individuals, they suffer increased risk of all cause mortality. So all yeah. causes of all deaths, 50%. Um, increase in, in all cause mortality if you're sedentary as opposed to just hitting the minimum guidelines. But also, if you go and then there's a bell curve, which is around sort of 300 minutes to 450 a week mm -hmm. of physical active moderate intensity and two to three times of resistance training. Once you go past that, which actually mirrors our hunter gatherer ancestors, actually pretty much identical. Mm -hmm. Once you go past that and you go into the sphere of elite athletes, you can actually, uh, again, start having these issues with chronic inflammation, with orthorexia, right. with upper respiratory tract infections, 
uh, you know, increased risk of injuries, probably long, long-term injuries and disabilities. So, you know, we need to be hitting that sweet spot where okay. we're promoting health. I'm, you know. I'm always curious in, in research like that about how much they break it down by activity type. And what I mean is I, I think about two things. One, uh, the endurance athletes, especially the ultra athletes, <clears throat> they, the, the hidden secret there is the number of those athletes who end up with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So the left ventricle yes. of the heart gets enlarged, uh, causes rhythmic problems. This is what Micah True, if people read Born to Run, this is what he died from. Uh, typically mm. when you have left ventricular hypertrophy, it leads to something essentially a heart attack. <clears throat> and people don't like to talk about that one, uh, not surprisingly. And then there's yes. the other side, there's people on my end, the power athletes, and we just tend to die earlier anyway. Uh, for various reasons. I'm not even sure what it is. You know, maybe live faster, die earlier <clears throat> or something. I, I don't know. They're, they're not as many power athletes, so they're a little trickier to study. But you look at, you look at power lifters, you look at sprinters, yes. you look at football players. Now, again, a lot of drugs involved in some of those. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's, that's a different story. But power athletes in general tend to, tend to you know, be on the, the lower side of that mortality curve as well. Yes. They, I mean, they, they tend to fare better apart from kind of NFL athletes where concussion obviously oh, plays yes. a part and, and average life expectancy is really low. I mean, yeah. it's much lower than sedentary individuals actually. Um, but in general, the, the, the fitter we are. So if you just look at, at not performance, mm-hmm. uh, not, not certainly not elite levels of performance, not even club club level of performance, but your, your average Joe or Jane, who has a fairly healthy spectrum of, of fitness and you know low resting heart rate, good BO2 right. max, um, you know good grip strength, good kind of you know mobility and function. I mean, those individuals tend to live the longest uh, with good quality function. You know, with uh, you know re- rejection in cognitive decline and the like. So, so I think there is a there is a way for us to to find that sweet spot yeah. in terms of the activities, and it tends to be, I would say a much more generalist approach to movement. So not certainly yeah. not being the ultra endurance athlete and probably not just being the, Oh, I'm just going to pump iron and that's all I'm going to do. Right. Um, I had a discussion with someone yesterday actually about, I don't need to do any cardio at all because I do more than enough when I'm, when I'm lifting weights and I'm like, have you seen how many, and again, drugs do conflate this a little bit, but I'm like, have you seen how many Olympic lifters, power lifters, you know, Body strong man, Competitors, yeah. bodybuilders, you know, they're, they're dropping, they're killing over yeah. and dying in their 40s, yeah. like 40s and 50s. So, you yeah. know, I wouldn't be too confident about, I don't need my, don't need aerobic or cardiovascular uh, yeah, I, I work. Good, I think that is a bit of my hobby. <laughs> I have a friend who's a, who, his, he's a, um, a long distance runner who has a great story though, where there's a whole other twist to this. He went to his doctor for a checkup, just like annual physical or something. And his doctor said, wow, your resting heart rate is like 42. That's amazing. And then the next day, just coincidentally, he was going to see um, a Chinese doctor who did traditional Chinese medicine. And the Chinese doctor took his pulse and it was 42. He said, oh my God, you're about to die. And, <laughs> and, the, and the difference is that in the West, the idea is your heart's in good shape because you know, you've done these things to get it so that it beats more slowly and more vigorously. And the Chinese idea is you only have a certain number of heartbeats. And so the things that yes. you've done to train to get to 42 <laughs> means you've worn it out and you're going to be dead soon. I don't know who's right, but man, I love the fact that it's like two totally different perspectives where you can really see each of them has, can, might have a point. Yes, you could see that they both have a point. I mean, the, the research actually, well, I suppose the West, most of the research is Western, but, but the research tends to, tends to point to, I mean, if you, if you can drop your resting heart rate by 10 to 15 beats per minute, you will half your risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease, oh, wow. type 2 diabetes, just that one change controlled for, for you know, many other things, control for diet uh, and so on, Str- uh, st- uh, stress that you're dealing with, sleep deprivation, all this controlled, just drop, dropping that, reducing that. Of course, there are ways you can reduce it, which are probably very extreme. Right. So even for myself, my resting heart rate used to be about 58 beats a minute when I, was, when I wasn't doing anything at all. Um, now I'm in the late 30s. So I, I, I can go down to 34 <laughs> right. and believe me when, when I've been monitored by my doctor, oh, they freak my out. doctors are always like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. You, we need to check for arrhythmias. We need to check that everything's <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah. And, and, um, I lost, uh, so I've had my heart checked regularly for the last sort of oh, 
10 to 12 years once, once, once that became, it became a lot lower. And I last had it checked this year again, 24 hour ECG, or EKG, mm-hmm. I think you guys call it. So I had a 24 hour EKG, all sorts of other tests. And fortunately at the end of it, they were just like, this is a really well conditioned heart, no issues. Yeah. Everything's good. Keep <laughs> doing what you're doing. And I don't do any, to, to be fair, I don't do any endurance or ultra endurance type of work. Um, I do mainly, you know, what anaerobic. You Most of my cardio is walking right. at, at a brisk pace. So I do quite a lot of brisk walking as well as kind of normal, normal pace walking. And I feel that's a much safer, lower stress form of cardio that probably suits me. I, um, I, I, was yeah. at the, I was at the doctor this years ago. It was when I was actually training more before I started a shoe company. Uh, and I went to the doctor and they, they wanted to do an EKG on me. And it was one of these things that it, it's a little portable device. It's you know, really fast. It is like 10 seconds. And that's all they need to, to get it. And they said, um, yeah, we have to get a new machine in here because you, in that 10 seconds, your heart's only beating twice. And so <laughs> we don't have enough info. <laughs> I said, I said no, I've been having this thing where when I stand up, I get a little lightheaded. And the doctor says, yeah, your resting pulse is 40. Your blood pressure is 110 over 70. What do you expect? <laughs> I said, yes, I, yeah, yes. Good point. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's good that, I mean, I think, whether you believe more on, on the Chinese side or, or Western medicine, I think it's just great that we can now have these, these additional diagnosis tools yeah. that can let us know that, hey, actually, you, know, you don't need a pacemaker or you, know, you haven't burnt yourself out you right. know, uh, uh, and you, don't have, you, know, you have really good blood pressure and you have a really good resting heart rate and you're, you respond well to stress because that's the other thing. Like if you, mm. you know, if you don't have a stress response and you, you know, you're completely chilled, even when it's, oh, it's danger, you know, like. <laughs> that's the one that's so interesting. A friend of mine, he had a company uh, years ago. He was the first person to do this. They, they had a neoprene vest that they had a bunch of sensors in so they could do real time uh, data sensing over 24, 48 hours with a, just how far back it was, a Palm Pilot. And so you have a Palm Pilot in the that's pocket. Back. It's recording data. And so there was this whole theory then about heart rate variability and that you want your heart to be able to go up and go down just as you breathe in the, your pulse goes up as you breathe out, it slows down just that alone. Uh, it was the first time they were able to measure that in real time. And the idea was that if you had no heart rate variability, then that was a bad sign. Um, people are, have developed apps for training, especially for distance runners to let you know if you've recovered enough after a run is when your heart rate variability kicks back into being normal instead of being flat where as you breathe in and out, it stays the same. And when they developed this, they had one of the guys, I think in their company, just put it on to test it. And he had like zero heart rate variability. And they said, mm-hmm. uh, you need to get to the doctor now. And they got yes. on the doctor, did an EKG. I think he had like a double bypass the next day. It was, you know, yes, really yes, yes, touch yes. and go. And people, I think, I think it's a really cool point you're making is people don't mm, appreciate that, that you are supposed to respond to stress. It is supposed to suck somewhat and you're supposed to be able to deal with that appropriately and come yes. back from that, 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 that whole mm, sine wave of how you're responding is the important part. Not this imagine totally chill, nothing affects me away we go. Yeah. 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 I mean that, that's, that's not a survival mechanism that, that, you know, it, it, it again, it makes me just, it, this makes me wonder about some of the, the negatives of the mindfulness movement, <laughs> transcendental meditation, is it's very easy to be chilled out in a dark room, you know, listening to Enya, incense burning, eyes closed, some, you know, dripping water, running water. You know, like, it's easy to be chilled in that scenario. <laughs> yeah. But, like, if something was to go down, you don't want to be the person who's like, oh, I'm just going to stay here and just stay chilled. No, you want to... It's like, I've got to go. We've got to, we've got to take action. Now, yeah. you know, so the, 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 the flight response is, is, <laughs> it's a real, is, is an important part yeah. of, of, of the stress response. Yeah. Well, some people, for some people, I had a, I had a very diehard, that's a fun way of saying that this phrase meditation practice uh, from the time I was about 18 till I was 38 and, and to develop the skill of knowing how to, chill out is good. Um, I was doing biofeedback back in 74 and I could do some really crazy things. I, I could change my, my uh, heart rate, my blood pressure pretty quickly. I could change my <clears throat> brain waves pretty significantly, muscle tension, temperature, all these 
pretty wacky things that uh, most people think are impossible or really, really difficult to, to master. But with the right, the right feedback, you can do it pretty quickly. But so being, getting that skill of being able to come down is nice. But frankly, for me, the thing that was the biggest, uh, how do I want to put asset, if you will, for being able to do that was not caring if I felt like crap. Yeah, yeah. I was. I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I can see the. I can see the merits and the benefit of that. And, <laughs> and of course, we do have a lot of background noise. Yeah. You know, perceived stress, and th- there are certainly ways that we can. You know, we should be able to maintain mindfulness and balance and being present. And you, you know, yeah, but you're stupid, you're stupid. You can't be smart when you're yeah. done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The all, I mean, the only thing that's changed for me, the biggest thing that's changed, is I stopped beating myself up with the idea that I should be feeling or doing something different than what I'm feeling or doing. So if I'm stressed yeah. out because all hell is broken loose, that's just the way it is until it passes and I, it doesn't turn into yes. a bigger thing because my typical yeah. response when something ma- major goes wrong is uh, scream and yell and run around for a few minutes and, and be completely non-functional in terms of coming up with a good solution. And then as soon as I calm down, I'm all about finding the, pro- the solutions. <clears throat> but that initial response is just a, you know, running around with my hair on fire and I got a lot of hair to be on fire. So, but that's just the way it is, you know, no big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Not acute, that. And you know, and that acute response you know, it forces us to be focused. It, it, you know, it, you, it, it helps us to be, maintain resilience. You know what's interesting resilience. on the forcing to be oh. focused? So I mentioned to you before we started this, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a kidney stone. And for people who know about these things, it was almost it was 6.4 millimeters, which is a big deal. It was the most excruciating thing I have ever felt in my life. But the thing that was so fascinating is that for brief moments, I couldn't do this continuously, but for brief moments, if I could... If I wasn't uh, trying to find a way to not feel the excruciating pain, if I could really just dive into the sensation, if you would, it was so Mm -hmm. all-encompassing. It was so big that it was oddly euphoric for brief moments. And then it would go back to, Jesus, you know, I mean, just (laughs) terrible pain. But like there was these Mm. pieces where I would literally get lost in the sensation and had no frame of reference for whether it was, it wasn't pleasant even, it was just, it was so all encompassing, there was nothing else, which was fascinating. Uh, and you can't get there, a friend of mine actually, he's, uh, he was one of the first Western meditation teachers, he unfortunately died a number of years ago. Uh, his idea is that meditation is actually an artificial process of trying to recreate the focus that you get when you're in pain. Because when you get that painful thing and it lets you focus like that, it's, yes. uh, you can't do it any other way. And there's a healing component to that kind of attention. And so his Ooh. idea is meditation is just to fake that and get the closest thing you can without wanting to kill yourself. And so uh, that his, and he has wow. a whole, whole thing he developed around that. It was very That's really interesting. interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I try to, 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 to bring that focal point around from a movement point of view, mindful movement mm-hmm. in, in, in the child at play. So a child at play regardless of how uh, busy their environment is, whatever's happening, whatever the intensity in terms of physical intensity of activity, they yeah. are mindful. They're, they're completely in the present. They're yeah. completely in it. So, so I would say, this is just from my focal point, that, that play is a great enabler of this, this mindful, nothing else matters, mm-hmm. problem mm-hmm. with what's happening right now. It's not even the end. Who cares about the end result? This feels good now and that's all that matters and there's that compression of time you know mm-hmm. five hours can can seem like it's only a couple of minutes that have you know have passed um or vice versa it's like oh this is, that was only five minutes but it felt like hours but in a right. pleasant in a pleasant way so I, I think um you know most of what we do in the 21st century unfortunately is a is a like a supplement or a substitute for, for what for would that. have happened naturally yeah. right whether it's for pain management whether it's for you know for physical activity interventions. And so we're trying to blend the best of the past with the best of the present and the understanding of the present. And, and so for me, plays is, has been my way of getting there. That's well, been my pathway. I want you to say more about what you do with that. And I, but I, I, and I want to see if you can frame it in this context. This is a, a conversation that I had um, way back when, when people do talk about what we did 
when we were hunter gatherers, I go, yeah, but you know, we're not walking back and forth to the river to get stones to make a house any longer. We're not having to walk 25 miles to get food and carrying an antelope back on our shoulders and then chilling out for two days. We're not finding a giant thing of honey where we eat, get, drink gallons of it and then don't eat for three days. So, um, you know, we, we can't real, and we're not running to something to be, make it food or away from something that thinks we're food where we get the whole hormonal okay. response. And I say, you know, the difference there, it's like, look, when I train as a sprinter, I don't get, I get a little sore maybe the next day, but then I do one race for 12 seconds and I'm done for four days, you know, whole different thing, training versus racing. Same thing if you're food or, or wanting to become food or not wanting to become yes. food. So talk to me about what you're doing in, with human beings um, re with regard to play and, and in the context of, of what really is what we can replicate and what we really can't because it's just not the same scenario. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, it's all modeling for sure. It's, it's all trying to create these almost algorithms to represent what we know anthropologically, what we can observe in present day hunter-gatherers what moving patterns, the volumes, the durations, the intensities. But I think why, why I feel my approach of looking at primal movement differs is because the imagination piece, mm. the play piece, the creativity piece, re tries to recreate some of these scenarios. So, so, of course, I can't put myself back into me being right. chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Um, um, but when I'm sprinting, I'll give you an example of me, my approach to sprinting now. I will play a game called chase the jogger. I will see a jogger. <laughs> I'll see a jogger, you know, a couple of hundred meters away. And I'm like, I'm just going to go. I'm the lion, that's gazelle. I'll stop a few meters behind them. So I don't, you know, I don't frighten them. But like, that's what I'll do. And I'll, I'll create. And I tell you what, I can run far faster in that situation. Yep. When I, you know, it, it feels far, I, I feel a much better hormonal response. Yep. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a situation that I've created. I have to get to that target. And many times I'm like, I just can't keep up. I'm just going to, I have to give up. And I'm like, no, 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 I've got to get there. This is, this is going to be my, I'm hunting now. You know? <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, public transport is, is a big thing in, in, in London, of course, pedestrianized city. And so sometimes I'll chase the bus. Right. I'll purposely miss miss the bus, and I'll try and I'll try and sprint to the next bus stop. Love it. You know, and people on the bus are like they're either laughing at me or concerned for my welfare. You know, and I'm huffing and puffing. And but I tell you what, you know, cr having a real scenario yeah, yeah. that really matters um, is I think gets us even closer to what we're trying to recreate <laughs> rather than it being, you know, right at 2 PM, I'm going to do a 200 meter sprint yeah. session in a fart leg training for, you know? Um, so for me, I've, I've tried to create a structured, unstructured approach to how I play and how I move and how I interact with the environment. When, when, I lived like, in, when I lived in Manhattan and rode my bicycle, I had the opposite of that, where uh, I was the gazelle and the cars were you know, the ones chasing me. And, yeah, and, it was, yeah. and, and for a long time, it was really fun. But then I, when I committed to moving away from Manhattan, I realized that part of what I was good at was just suppressing sheer terror. <laughs> but although yes, that is, it's pretty terrifying chased, but, but when you're being chased that's actually <laughs> what's going on and and yes. i gotta tell you that was when i was in the best shape of my life <laughs> yeah no i'm not surprised but yeah you, you know you can create you know if i'm doing a group session we will you know we'll 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 create that scenario and again it's like being a kid yeah when you're a kid chasing games yep no one teaches kids to, to play uh, chasing games it's part of their dna you know it's like dogs playing chase kids will do it. It's a universal game. And I think this is part of what um, stays with us. That's what stayed in our DNA. And so, right, we can't replicate all of that environment from the past, but a lot, so much of it is still within us. Mm -hmm. That as kids, we recreate it. Kids will still continue to crawl, even though they can start walking properly, right? They will crawl over things, even though it may not be socially acceptable to climb. Right. You know, but they will, it's like, no, we want to do this. We want to jump. We want to climb. We want to carry, you know, let's piggyback carry. They, they, they had no context for that. It's just like, they don't see adults doing that. Right. Right. Carrying each other necessarily, but it's just like, no, let's just do this. So I've just tried to recreate that, that nostalgic aspect of my childhood 
recognizing that most of it is not just about childhood, but it's part of our is human behavior that as adults, we suppress very well. Right. And for m- most of the animal kingdom, they continue that, you know, big cats will still continue to play. They don't just go, ah, oh, we're big cats now. We don't play anymore. They have, they'll pretty much play, you know, not the same sort of frequency, right. But they will continue to play and they'll still, uh, they'll still have very dynamic and vigorous and powerful movements, graceful movements, even into old age. And so I feel for me, if I try to maintain that youthful, exuberant aspect of movement that is childlike, not childish, mm. because I understand the importance now as a, as a man, I'm like, no, this is really important. And, you know, that's, I'm not doing this to just roll around and go, Hey, isn't this fun? <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, it might be fun, but I'm not getting, I want to improve my health and my longevity and, and my mental focus and cognition. So I've got to be serious about this. And so you, when you look at kids or when I look at kids now, I'm like kids, most of their time when they play, they're very serious about it. Mm-hmm. They are, they're looking at risk. They're evaluating risk. They're looking at conflict resolution. They're creating rules they you know, they're changing things up on the fly because, oh, this is boring. Let's mix things up. You know, isn't it better when the adults aren't around because we can get do some stuff that the adults wouldn't let us do? You know, <laughs> that's part of their play experience. And a lot of it isn't laughing and joking. Right. A lot of it is very serious, really focused. Let's concentrate. How are we going to do this? How are we going to work together? If you don't want to play, play a part, you're going to be left out. You know, we're social creatures. Do you want to be part of this community or do you want to be the bully? You so, know, it's so yeah. funny. I, w- I watched something on YouTube last night. It was a world parkour championships and there was a whole lot of, of play involved in it, of course, but you know, what was incredibly lacking is something you just mentioned that I hadn't thought of is nobody was, they weren't, no one was ever doing anything together. It's all just an individual thing and it's competition yes. and it's fun, but no one's doing anything together. And yes. that would be a whole amazing twist to that. Yes. Activity. Yes, because the most, the purest form of play is when it involves other people. Yeah. Right? It's not, yeah, of course you can play by yourself, but, you know, it's much better when you're, you're, you're creating, you, you know, you're involved in creating the play space, the play environment, the rule set. You equalize because, oh, you're, you're new to the game, so let's make it a bit easier for you. Let's change the rules on the fly. You know, oh, we haven't got the right equipment. Who cares? Let's do, you know. So I, I, I do think for adults, even though we've got all of these like OCR racing, you know, for example, where they go, okay, we do have some, a teamwork element, mm-hmm. you know, that is part of that. Right. Um, or CrossFit where, yeah, we've got a group, we've got great camaraderie and, but most of it is still about, individual. about the individual. Yeah. The individual gets the medal, yep. you know, um, yeah, I'll help you. But if I'm going to, if I'm going to lose by helping you, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Um, so, so we've got a lot to learn from, I would, I would say from childhood play uh, and, and, and the true play ethos. Which so what's another means example of something we we'll do in a primal play workshop with people to mm-hmm. get them into this? So I, I play a version of tag called primal play tag, uh, which, um, is like a modified, modified kids game where you play partners or, or as a group. And you'll just pick certain parts of the body you can you can tag and you'll play simultaneously, and and for some it might start off quite combative, but then when you realise you are almost like one to have a rally, and and so most people are laughing immediately and they're getting out of breath and they're you know it's really challenging on their balance and coordination, but if you can get laughter instantly and you're enjoying the process but you're still getting all the ticking all the boxes the fitness boxes, the components of fitness boxes, that's what I'm trying to, to recreate. So mm-hmm. animal movements are a big part of that, you know, different types of crawls and jumps and again, creating this environment where you go, it just doesn't matter what people, what I look like, <laughs> you know, what are people wondering what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, and you know, you finish your session, you finish your, your game and you feel, you don't just feel great because of the endorphin rush, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 being swamped with, you know, endocannabinoids because it's like your body's like, oh, I'm in pain. Oh, don't worry about it. Here's some endorphins to suppress the pain. You feel great because you felt great for the entire time. Right. right? You've been you've been laughing. You've been joking. You've been releasing oxytocin. You've been maintaining eye contact. 
you've recognized that collaboration and cooperation matters and the, competi the competi competitive element drops significantly. So, so that's something we've, we've lost, I would say, as adults. We've lost the ability to truly just play the game. Right. Um, and, you know, wouldn't it be great to see, I don't know if you ever see, if you watch Wimbledon, for example, or, or the tennis, and sometimes, you know, players have been knocked out and they'll be doing training sessions with some of the some of the guys who are still going through, and they'll just, you know, they'll start doing trick shots. Right. You know that they'll they'll like the ball will bounce twice. Who cares? You know they're not trying to ace each other on the on smashing each other on the serve, and they'll have these incredible rallies, and they're laughing and joking. And so that's I suppose that's what I'm trying to create. Yeah, yeah. You're almost creating this this rally mentality where it's like you know, or you're playing you know you're playing soccer, and you're like just keep the ball up, whatever it takes. You know, everyone just you know, the ball cannot, cannot touch the ground. Well, you know, uh, and, yeah, yeah. What you're, what you're describing is interesting because it's not, it's not that the competition has been removed, but it's, been, but it's sort of serving a different purpose. Um, yes, it's not that. It's not the. Or it's a different. Um, kind of, it's a different type of competition. You're not trying to win slash beat someone. Even if you're, you know, when you're playing tag, there's definitely. But it has a different flavor. Uh, like, you know, if you're working with people that keep the ball up, I mean, that's, there's definitely a goal. You're trying to do it, but you're also yeah. doing it and rooting for everyone. You're trying to be helpful for everyone, everyone at the same time. Yes. Yes. So you're trying to keep, you know, it's like dogs play fighting. You could have a, a boxer dog, Great Dane and a Chihuahua mm -hmm. and they can play fight. Right. And the boxer knows if I just smack the Chihuahua the first time we, we start play fighting, it's game, the end, that's the end of the game. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, like I've, I've not, I've not the Chihuahua out. That's it. If the, the boxer reigns it in or the great thing reigns it in, the Chihuahua can still go hundred percent and they keep that game going. That's what it is. It's still competitive. It's still, you know, it's still part of that, but it's not the main aim. Right. And, and, um, and so, yeah, pretty much it's the activity, not so much. It's the, it's the attitude mm. that you bring towards the game that you bring towards the movement pattern, which is, is important. What so do you I've just modified games to make them and activities to make them more playful, but to still give you the, the result you want from fitness. I, I'm thinking of, I'm comparing this to the things that are popular where on the one hand is there, there, the comp, the competitive part it is completely out. I'm thinking of something like Zumba, which I referred to um, as New Age aerobics, and um, and and I'm and and, and 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 I'm not trying to denigrate it really because it's it is it can be terribly fun. Just you know, not my thing. Um, but I know people who totally love it. But again, there's nothing. There's there's not a real challenge there. There's certainly no competitive aspect. Versus the exact opposite, like you know, boot camp classes, where on the one hand, hey, congratulations, you're out on the grass in a park. On the other hand you're just at the gym with someone yelling at you. And yeah. so uh, what you're describing is something that is, I don't want to call it an amalgam certainly, but it's, it's a different point that, that encapsulates and encompasses a number of things from each in a way that I, I love much more. Anyway, that's a big setup for what do you think it's going to take for more and more people to have that primal play experience or to make that something where people see that as a, uniquely valuable alternative with a whole different set of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, attributes. Um, that's not it. A whole different set of, 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 but a bunch of things that you get, you can't get any other way. And uh, whatever that word is that I, that I can't find, what's it going to take to move this, uh, this idea yeah. so compelling forward? It's, it's, it's really just a case of people experiencing it. So, so I've traveled, I've traveled a lot. I've, I've been exposed to lots of different audiences from the most serious, you know, elite athletes to those who've been very sedentary, you know, couch potatoes, those who have mobility issues, and you know, very young to much older adults. And for most people, once they experience this, it's because it's part of us. Right. Fun movement, enjoyable movement is part of us. It just kind of people just, you know, have this kind of eureka moment where they go, hold on a second, I've got, you know, it's like a bit like muscle memory, right? You know, we've all got this muscle memory if we were formerly fit or athletic or did track at school or whatever, and it doesn't take much for us to get that back. We've all got this play memory. We've all got this fun and joy for movement that pretty much was condensed in most of our childhoods. 
and we try to recreate it in adulthood and we fail miserably. Yeah. The closest we probably get to it actually is at maybe at a wedding and everyone's had a drink <laughs> and people, you know, haven't done, you know, get on the dance floor yeah. and they couldn't care less what they look like. And, you know, and, and that's probably, you know, and they, and it's like that, you know, you get, you see the eight year old granny who like, moving like she's 16 you know you yeah. haven't seen her get she hasn't got out of chair for years and she's all of a sudden it's like oh my gosh my son my favorite song's on and she you know she walks on with a walking stick but she, she throws it away and start dancing for a bit and you know like so so it's it's almost like getting adults to re, to appreciate that that inner child is always there uh, no you you, you are so right, though, about the wedding thing. I'm just having flashbacks. My mom was famous. What's the, the Russian dance thing where you're, you're squatting and then you kick out one leg, whatever that's you know, called? Like Cossack dancing, I think. Yeah, it yeah. Is. Isn't it Cossack or something? Yeah. yeah. So my mom could do that. And like up into her 60s, you know, and every time it was a wedding, there she was. And, you know, she was never active, never did anything else. But at a wedding, and she didn't even need a couple of drinks. She just needed, you know, the barest amount of encouragement. <laughs> just like, hey, so, so yeah, so just people having having fun in 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 a, in a community sense. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, so so I'm spreading the word in in relation to this. I'm getting people to to experience this. I'm writing books. I have courses. I'm training trainers. I have a certification program. So it isn't just relying on me now. Yeah. There are other disciples who 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 believe that this is an important kind of intervention and, and, is, and is different enough to say, you know, not disparaging anything else, but it's like, yeah. if you do want to have a love affair with movement, which is more love than hate mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and that you can do anywhere. And you recognize that you are the best equipment you have mm -hmm. and, and wherever you're at is the best gym you, you're in. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. Yeah. Um, and if you want joy from it, from movement, this is what we're, we're offering. And if and you want not, not only joy, but also gains, right. you know, um, which are not just physical, of course, but if you want physical gains and you want the mental benefits and stress reduction and interaction with other social interaction with other humans, um, and you want to go, you know what? I just spent three hours moving, but it felt like five minutes. Tick, tick, tick. And to be clear, it's not like we're suggesting that this is the only thing that people should be doing. You know, it's it's part, like you were saying, we were talking about beginning, it's part of being, you know, the the whole, well, yeah, but, I mean, um, uh, but it's part of part of the sort of, the, let's call it the whole fitness package. I mean, for me, one of the things that I like about sprinting, it's funny, my, uh, my mind is not li very linear. If you look in my office, there's just a bunch of piles of things. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I, organization is not my strongest suit. Um, but when it comes to physical things, I'm the exact opposite. I love things that are precise. Sprinting is very precise. I love target shooting, like archery, or when I was a kid, I did uh, I did target shooting, rifle shooting. Um, uh, mm. Things things where it really like at the end of a race, when someone says, "How'd you do?" My answer is, "Do you want it with the excuses, or do you just want the time?" Because you never get it perfect. And I, <laughs> yeah. and I but I love that. There's something about the intermittent reinforcement of never being able to get it perfect, and you're always trying. At the end, yeah. at the same time, to turn that off. And and just roll around and have fun. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that's what primal play is, but the flip side of doing things that are just fun, that's just another, another flavor. It's a different, a different scoop of ice cream and having all of that. Is, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's like having a smorgasbord buffet or do you want to go to a five star, you know, Michelin restaurant, you know, at the end of the day, they're both serving food, <laughs> you know, they can both serve very nutritious food it's just a different way of getting there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to have this experience and I encourage them to do so, um, tell, tell humans where they can track you down or track primal play down. Yeah. The best place is probably my blog, which is primalplay.com. Um, I'm known as the fitness explorer. So you can search on, on social media channels, Instagram, Twitter, uh, on YouTube for the fitness explorer. Um, I have a book called animal moves, which was a, Amazon bestseller. It's a great book. The UK and the, and the US. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And also probably the best primer, you know, 16 or 17 minutes or so, um, is my TED Talk, uh, Why Working Out Isn't Working Out. And I think that probably covers... It's a good, yeah. yeah. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good, good introduction to, to, to how you can get in touch with me. 
any, I was, I was going to, I was going to ask anything we left out, but as the words started kind of coming out of my mouth, I realized there's nothing, we didn't have an agenda. Um, and certainly we, we covered a bunch of topics that we never expected because I don't plan any of this. Um, but is there anything else that you want to add before we call it a day and thank people for joining us? Yeah, I suppose if you want to find out more about the importance of play, mm. I do have a free ebook available at my website um, at primalplay.com. And I also have a, a significant evidence base. So if you're interested in some of the science, yeah. not only about play, but also about physical activity and the health benefits, physical and cognitively, then come on to my website and uh, there's more than enough to keep you interested yeah. uh, for a and while. And it's one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that this isn't just some idea that you cooked up and away you go, just trying to convince people without anything uh, under underpinning it, not that people need the the evolutionary underpinning, but to see that it's there. Some people actually do; they really need to justify it in some way. But also, yes. just to see it. It's 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 just a it's a nice thing. In the same way that we're talking about like different physical activities being valuable, to have both the physical and the cognitive piece playing together, it's just helpful so that you don't feel like you're just you know, you know goofing around. That there's that there's really a, a there there. It connects you to history in an unusual way it connects you to uh, i mean i don't want to sound uh, overly new agey in this wacky way but i mean it really does connect you to humanity in a way that you can't y you may get on your own just from doing the play i was going to say the work but it's doing the play because you yes. feel it but um but yes. to actually understand that as well it just gives it an extra depth like the physicist richard Feynman, someone said to him you know i, I would hate to be you because you just see everything as like mathematics he goes oh no no no, no. you don't understand for me it's so much richer when you see a glass of water you see a glass of water i'm just amazed mm. see through molecules and around atoms and how the the, the light is reflect refracted refracted sometimes i can't even pick up the glass because i'm so awestruck by a glass of water and you know same thing wow yes and just to, as i was in closing um it's attributed to einstein but einstein did say play is the highest form of research <laughs> so, so I think for somebody like Einstein to, to have said this is, is also pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah, I'd say it's a little out of context, but I get your point. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> it is just a bit. But, but, but it is attributed to him, and I suppose it's just describing... I think, I, know, think what, being, I, I think what he meant by that is that, that so much of what scientific research is is an intellectual form of play because you're really just toying with these ideas until something starts to sift out of, of not being linear, not being rigid, of really just enjoying where it's going to go and how it's going to go. And there are, you know, some rules that you're playing with. So it, it's, it, I would say that, that, that what he's talking about is, let's call it the intellectual version of exactly what you've been talking about. Yes, exactly. Oh, I, I totally agree. Yes, yeah. it, it enables you to be a better scientist if, because you're constantly thinking about you know, what's outside of, of my present consciousness. Yeah, what, do I, what, what, are the, what are the known unknowns? What do I know that I don't know? And how can yes. I start playing in that realm and see what I discover? Um, what I discover. It's my favorite thing when physicists, when, when they're about to discover some new thing or examine some new thing that they haven't been able to look at before, half of them are going, oh God, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Because if yes. they're wrong, it means everything is upset. Everything is on the, is open for for reinterpretation, which is incredibly exciting and very playful. And boy, to you know, to have it, especially at that level, where with our current understanding of the way the world works, to get something totally new would be just, oh man, what a blast that would be. It's this morning again with your with your whatever your your toy, the toy that you wished for as a kid, I suppose. And, you, and birth, your birthday morning, it's just a, a, another year. Oh my goodness, what am I going to get this year? What, yeah. you know, what has come yeah. out this year? What technology has, has, has led to this device that I have in front of me? But yeah, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you, Stephen. For, uh, for as sure. always, Daryl. So, well, A, thank you again. B, I hope people do take you up on it and go to primalplay.com. Uh, in signing off, um, thank you all for being here, of course, and being part of the movement movement, where, as I like to say, we are creating a movement movement of getting people to understand that natural movement is the obvious, better, healthy choice the way natural food is. And I want to thank Daryl for being one of the people who's contributing to the, this new zeitgeist, if you will. And that is a phrase that is way too ridiculous to have said, but there it came out of my face anyway. So if you want to be part of the movement movement, and I would love it if you 
are, go to jointhemovementmovement.com. You can find out all the ways that you can interact with us. If you have any questions or comments or want to uh, make a recommendation for anything on the show, you can also just email move at jointhemovementmovement.com. And of course, do all those things to review and share and like and click on the subscribe button and hit the bell on YouTube. As I like to say, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. Thank you so much. And until next time, live life feet first.